Welcome to our full year presentation for the year ending 30 April 24. I'm going to start with a brief overview of the year and set the scene for Kate to then go through the numbers in more detail. And then I'll pick up after that and end with a section on our strategy for growth. I think the key question that most people have and certainly we have is the return to organic growth. We've seen a return. It's a very modest return to organic growth. But I think much more importantly, we see it as an inflection point for further now improvements in our organic growth going forward. And we're becoming more and more confident about a return to high single digit organic growth. Kate will give the bridge to the year ending 24 and touch upon the sort of building blocks for moving forward as to why we see that high single digit now returned. So it really is an inflection point more than just the organic growth number to 30 April 24. We've seen an improvement in profit margins. We see that continuing too. We've worked hard on the cost base in the last 12 months with the improving organic growth and the improving macro environment. Then we certainly now see our profit margins also increasing going forward into FY25. The market conditions have improved for us, particularly in residential property. And again, Kate will highlight what we're seeing in current trading going forward in FY25. We've seen in this period reported an improvement in recruitment. And again, we see that carrying on. The scale of this business now is starting to attract more people. It's better known. It's becoming the start of a national brand for what we've built. The resilience, we've always talked about the resilience. When we listed, we talked about this in economic conditions. So economic downturns, this business is resilient. I think we've shown that in this trading period. There's definitely been a couple of headwinds with residential property and M&A, but I think overall the business has shown strong resilience in an economic downturn that's happened in 22 and 23. Finally, the acquisitions that we've done in the last two or three years, the last eight acquisitions have traded ahead of our expectations and we're really seeing strong integration for those acquisitions that have come on board. And just going to the map, the point of this really, I think, to begin with, is the integration. We've really built to date. We've been out this 12 years, six years since IPO. And to date, we've built now a fully integrated national business. This isn't a gathering or amalgamation of small businesses at all. We work really hard with a very experienced team now to integrate. And so what? Well, that's the strength of the business. When you've got an integrated business, and we focus very much on one team culture, you can start to share work across experience levels and you can start to bring all of your disciplines and expertise to the client to grow the share of the wallet with the clients. So it's very important for the strength of the business and that's what we've built today. We've taken our time in the last 12 months and not really accelerated growth because we wanted to finish off integration of everything that we've acquired historically in those last eight that we've done in the last two or three years. And that's what we've got today. The map also shows where we're heading next. The dark orange on this map shows the work that we want to do to complete England and Wales. So over the next two or three years, we're going to be looking to fill those gaps that you can see in the dark orange in England and Wales. We will at some stage, I imagine the next 12 months, have a very small office in London. We're a regional business. We're going to continue being regional. But we do want to now have a small base for our regional business to go and trade in London. We have more and more people that go into London to get work and then it's serviced from the regions and we need therefore a small platform to go into London. That is not to compete with London businesses. It is merely to be an office for our regional business to trade from so we can go and win more work in London and have it serviced in our regional business. But the next two or three years is all about completing England and Wales growth. I think beyond that, we definitely see opportunities in Scotland which is the lighter shade for longer term potential and beyond that possibly Dublin but that's way further down the road. So that's the next sort of short and medium term growth strategies for us location continuing to integrate all the time so that we remain one business one team. The mix of work on this slide hasn't really changed that much we're still very much commercial focused commercial services for corporate clients is 65 percent we have seen some growth in private wealth and we anticipate continuing to see that. Private wealth is a very profitable part of our business. There's a real gap in the market in private wealth because the top 
50 law firms have largely disregarded it over the last 20 or 30 years. Some are now returning because they see that profitability. We've been in it now throughout. We can see that growing further as a percentage of revenue, maybe by two or three percentage points, particularly with a changing tax regime that we anticipate private wealth will continue to flourish and grow from strength to strength. In the last two or three years, our clinical negligence business, CL Medal Law, the subsidiary down there, 9%, has also grown and flourished. It's very profitable. It's very successful. It's becoming very dominant in its clinical negligence, cerebral palsy specialization. And we continue to see that grow. I think the growth will slow down a little bit now, but that's really grown in the last two or three years. But the mix of business, pretty similar, focused on corporate clients, but also alongside that, the private wealth, which is a huge opportunity for us to fill that gap, especially in the regions. We've put some thought into how to explain the uniqueness of Knights. It's quite challenging for people to understand, I think, law as a segment because there's so few listed. So I think law firms are tricky to understand for investors, but I think our business is unique even compared to law firms. So I just want to spend two minutes trying to explain the real nature of this. And I think this does succinctly put it. So we changed the structure 12 years ago to create an owner-managed business separating ownership from partnership. And that allowed us to develop a culture, a one-team culture and a collaborative culture. You don't find a collaborative culture like Knights anywhere in legal services where people share work across 23 offices and a 1,000 fee owners. The power and strength of collaboration is that we create a national business focused on premium services for corporate clients and private wealth clients. That means we win more clients acting as one business rather than a silo of individual lawyers or teams or offices where they can fight for each other for fees. We don't do that, and we haven't done it for 12 years. This is a real unique culture that exists in legal services. From that growing presence and more dominance in the regions allows us to have pricing power because we're doing more for clients and we're doing more for larger clients. And it allows us to continue to increase prices and have pricing power in the regions because we're competing with smaller businesses compared to our national business. From a regional cost base, this creates I mean, really strong margins and financial results. From there, we can pay people really well and be the regional leader we are, particularly outside Manchester, Birmingham, and Leeds, in what we call the tertiary locations, outside the secondary of Manchester, Birmingham, and Leeds, that we are a very good payer. And we're very attractive for people to come and join. That's why we're very confident that more people will want to join this and that we'll continue to recruit strong numbers, as we've just seen in this year we're reporting. Also, when you're the dominant player, particularly in the tertiary locations, people stay because you're the local slaughter may in your given location. So that's how it all works. And that's the strength of it that's very different. And that's why we're very confident in this going forward and how we can grow the business. But it is different, it is unique. Finally, for me, just showing here the compound annual growth for the last five years we've put on this slide, it's 23%, 22%. That's why we've been going steadier because of all the things we had to do through COVID and then through a downturn and through all the integration that we've worked on to create this fully integrated business. We're still growing at that rate. We will pick that rate up now, we believe. We're very confident now we can return to pre-five-year growth rates when we didn't have some of the headwinds we've just experienced. I want to talk more about our medium term growth strategy after Kate's gone through some of the numbers. Just on this next slide here then, just a high level review of the year. As David said, I think we're pleased with delivering a good performance despite the macroeconomic challenges that have obviously been in the environment this year. We've delivered revenue growth, increasing revenue to 150 million, increased our margins increased our underlying EPS and again delivered exceptionally good cash conversion. So I think those headline figures are really good and we'll talk an awful lot more about all of those in detail as we go over the pages. But that cash conversion that we've done has put us in a net debt position of 35 million at the end of the year. That in terms of our bank covenant ratio is 1.1 times, which is down from where we were at the end of the year last year. We were about 1.2 times and that is achievable because we continue to deliver exceptional lockup. And you can see that our lockup that was already good last year at 87 days has improved even further to 78 days. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Summarising the PL in a little bit more detail then. Revenue, I've got a detailed revenue bridge over on the next page. So I'll talk about that and the component parts of that in more detail. Picking up 
on other items here. Got gross margin, pleasingly, that's improved slightly from 48.5% to 48.8%. That's whilst we've still invested. So David's talked about that we've recruited 40 senior recruits during the year compared to 20 last year. So recruiting people can quite often decrease your gross margin, but we've actually managed to increase gross margin by that due to our focus on pricing and rates per fee which we'll see on the KPIs, and our cost control and making sure that we're controlling our costs well. So pleasing with where we've moved that to, we do expect that to start to nudge up further as well as we continue to focus on our pricing and keeping our costs under control. In terms of operational staff costs, our operational staff costs have increased marginally in the year's percentage of revenue, but it's definitely been a year of consolidation for us where we've spent the time to centralise an awful lot of our systems, everything that we've done from the acquisitions. We've done 23 acquisitions over the last five years. We've brought everything together, centralised a number of our support functions and used automation in various areas to enable us to get some savings in terms of our operational staff costs, which we will start to see the benefit of in FY25 and beyond. You don't see them much in here, but you'll see them going forward into next year. So pleasing with what we've managed to achieve there. In terms of other costs... Our other operating charges, a marginal increase as a percentage of revenue to last year, but that has been due to investment in BD and IT. But pleasingly, again, we've made considerable savings in other central costs, such as RPI insurance, the synergies that we've gained on things like photocopying contracts and pulling all of that together, which having a year of consolidation has really enabled us to do that. So consolidate all of our costs whilst investing in the things that are important for us to grow the business. And that investment in BD will help to grow the top line and will then start to leverage those costs going forward. Other operating income, we've talked about that an awful lot in prior years, but that's our interest on client account and increasing last year just because we've had the higher interest rates for the full year. We expect interest rates are going to remain. It is going to be a line of income going forward. It may drop off slightly as interest rates will most probably drop off over the next year or so, but it's not going to disappear. It is going to be there and be a continued feature of our p as it was prior to 2008. There will be a slight softening in that, but that will be more than offset by the savings we're expecting to see or the improvement in margin in gross profit and the other costs as well. Our property costs, IFRS 16 costs that you can see there, they've started to leverage already this year. Again, having done 23 acquisitions, you inherit quite a property portfolio. We spent the year and we continue to spend into FY25 consolidating that managing it and leveraging those costs. You can see some leveraging already happen this year and we'll start to see some further leverage over into the next few years. So looking at the business as a whole, you can see our margin has increased from 15.2% to 16.9%. Pleasingly, if you split it out into half years, our margin in H2 was actually 18.4% compared to 17.8%, which I think is starting to show the benefits of some of the synergy savings that we did in the first half of the year. And that is helping us to generate future margin growth into future years. In terms of forecast, I know you'll ask me where we expect that to go. We're looking to increase our margin. I would always say we'll look to do that at a gradual pace. We're looking to grow that. It will be, but we will continue to invest in our IT and recruitment as we need to. But that margin, I expect all of the indicators are there that that will start to grow in future years. So looking at the revenue bridge and giving a little bit more flavour about this, we we'll split it into acquisition income and organic income. The acquisitions that we've done there, as David said, are all performing ahead of expectations. FY23, we acquired Globe, we acquired Mead King and we acquired Coffee Mew. There's been a slight softening in some of the residential property work in Coffee Mew, but other than that, they are all performing well, integrated well and performing ahead of where we expected them to be. FY24 acquisitions, Baines Wilson and St. James, which we acquired in June 23, are performing exceptionally well ahead of recruitment, ahead of expectations, and are also providing a really good basis for us to recruit into. So we've recruited well into those. We've recruited six people into the Newcastle office already, which will generate our organic growth into FY25. So really pleased with how those have operated. We then look at organic growth, that nets down at 1.9% organic growth for the year. But you can see that there are various different components in that. We've had the headwinds, as we talked about, at half year from residential property and MA. The high debt costs have meant that residential property and MA have been depressed. And so that has had a negative impact on organic income 
of 4.6%. Strategic reductions there. We've always talked about in the past that we run the business to maximise profit, not just to maximise revenue growth. So we had an area in the business insolvency and restructuring, which some areas of that just weren't at the profit level that we'd wanted to be. They were actually making small losses. And so we made the strategic decision, again, to maximise profitability to come out of those. But that has a negative impact on your organic growth. If we take all of that out and look at the rest of the business, the non-cyclical part of the business that's not been affected by the debt markets, that just generated organic growth of 8.4 million or 6.3%. So I think a reasonable organic growth there. Some areas in there, private clients, immigration, dispute resolution, performing exceptionally well, performing up to you know, sort of high teens organic growth in there. So it's a real mixture of various different things in there, but a really pleasing point and I think that as Dave has talked about our return to high single digit organic growth going forward that is the basis on which we base this and show that it is actually achievable if we look at where we think we'll go next year the key building blocks to our higher organic growth pricing we'd expect to see pricing going up the main driver behind our increase this year that 6.3 percent has been the pricing increases that we've put through so I'd say around about four to five percent in terms of pricing residential property we have seen an increase in that this year so we look at the number of new matters that are coming into the business on a weekly basis and if we compare the period from first of may to now this year compared to the same period last year we have seen a 30 percent increase in new instructions coming in so if we take that and roll that through into next year that gives us another two percent organic growth there's then other building blocks will be the corporate and m a market we're not seeing that quite increase yet but we expect to see that come now markets will hopefully settle a little bit with the new government coming into place and everything settling down and into the second half of the year we expect to see m a market coming back the strong recruitment that we've done we'll start to see the full year effect of those coming through and also as david will talk about some new client wins that we're getting through some and selling more of our services to our existing clients will drive again so that's giving you another two or three percent there getting you to the high single digit organic growth going forward the underlying pbt bridge here we've talked about most of these points here going from last year to this year biggest increase is increase in gross margin driven by the revenue growth and then also the slight improvement in gross margin going forward and those costs there we've talked about yes they've all increased as the business has increased but we are starting to see leverage of those and expect to see them <coughs> leverage as we go forward key kpis that we look at as a business gross margin we've talked about we focus on a premium focused on pricing and that has helped us to increase our gross profit while still investing in new recruits coming into the business fees per fee earner you can see there a 10 percent growth from one 131,000 to 145,000 in the year, mainly driven by pricing and our focus on premium and quality. Um, the quality of the recruits coming into us is meaning we can generate higher fees. Our average number of fee earners in the year, you can see, has dropped off from 1077 to 1037. There's a breakdown further back in the pack which shows that, but the main reduction there is due to a reduction in people in our integral business. That's our volume remortgage business, which has been hit a little bit by the debt markets and so there's natural churn in that business anyway so we've let that happen and that's been the main reason for that reduction in fear and is that interesting point is the one on the top right cash generation i think that shows a really good trend of our cash generation and how good we are at generating cash and the earth you can see over the last three years there we've generated over 60 million in terms of free cash flow and that has enabled us to invest in acquisitions, pay dividends and invest in the CapEx, invest in the property and the IT going forward. And that forms a big part of our growth strategy going forward. Cash flows, again, here, and our cash generation, 131% this year compared to 117% last year. Pleasing results, a slight increase in our working capital, again, mainly driven by the growth in our clinical negligence business. But if you do look at our WIP days and our WIP as a percentage of our revenue, it is actually coming down, showing that that's all good. It's all good WIP. It's being converted regularly and we're generating really good cash from our operations, which is allowing us to invest in our property. We've invested about eight million in our property portfolio this year. So although we're making savings, we're as amalgamating savings, we're needing to refurbish and go into new offices. So we spent on that. We're investing in recruitment. Every time we recruit someone, that uses some of our cash acquisitions and then our technology to make sure that we're at the cutting edge of what we need to do. So our cash conversion is generated mainly by our 
focus on working data days, working lockup days, working capital days, which basically is the amount of time it takes to convert a unit of time spent into cash in the bank. So it's our whip days, which is the amount of time it takes us to bill an item, and then our debtor days, which is how long it then takes us to actually collect the cash. And you can see there a really pleasing trend. We always calculate our lockup days, excluding the clinical negligence work in progress, because it is so different. They operate in terms of years, in terms of their lockup period. It can be two or three years to build something, but it's continuing, it's moving on, it generates cash, it's very profitable. So it's a really important part of our business. But what we don't want is the other 91% of our business to be impacted, thinking that that's acceptable. We want them to be working to the 78 days that we do. But what I have done on the top, just to show what our whip days would be, um, including everything, we've put lock up there in that brown line across the top, which shows lock up, including all of our work in progress and all of our debtors, which again shows that that's starting to come down this year. So pleasing in terms of that and on the right hand side you can see the opportunity that is available to us as we acquire businesses we are industry leading in terms of our lockup and you can see there from what we acquire how different their profile is and then once they've been with us for two three years how we manage to get their profile down to much more in line with ours and it's not rocket science as we've talked about before it is just encouraging people to pick up the phone chase clients to say you can't have an outstanding debtor to do that, to build our clients on a regular basis, not wait until completion and not be driven by the client, but driven by us. And it's part of our culture that helps to drive that. And Dave's talked about our culture. We have one team. Everybody has to work towards our debtor days target of 90 days. And that generates some really good results and generates that strong cash conversion that we've talked about. Over onto the balance sheet. Not an awful lot to pick up on here. The one point I will mention is just our loan to the joint venture. So that was our investment in Convex, which we did towards the end of the year. That's a joint venture, which is Convex, are a corporate finance. They're going out and they're acquiring businesses for people. It's a joint venture for us. It will come in as just a one line. There's nothing in our budgets at the moment because of its lumpy nature. It's volatile. I've not included any income for that. The first amount of income will be repaying the loan we've put into that. It is performing exceptionally well at the moment. It's seen an awful lot of activity, which gives us confidence that the legal side of that M&A work will come further down into the second half of the year. But that confidence and seeing how busy they are means that we're fully confident that that loan will be repaid within the next 12 to 18 months. And then moving over just briefly onto our net debt bridge, the key points to make is that we are very cash generative. You can see there just under 25 million of cash generated from operations and then how we've spent that over the year on CapEx, on investing in the business in terms of acquisitions and on paying our dividends in there. At the year end, we're in a really good position. We've got a 70 million facility available to us until November 2026. We've got headroom there then of 35 million at the year end, which gives us lots of scope for going and funding acquisitions going forward. In terms of our covenant, we're at only 1.1 times at the year end. So where we'd take that to 1.5 times, our banking covenant allows us to take it up to two, two and a half. But we know in the markets with one and a half times is where we'd expect to be. But that still gives us plenty of scope to invest and fund acquisitions going forward. And then because of the headroom and because of our confidence, we have declared a dividend at the year end of 2.79p. They can to 4.40p, which gives us a 9% increase on the dividend that we declared last year. I'll hand over to David. Thank you. Just want to just go back briefly to a slide Kate did on acquisitions. That slide there, you can see the massive reduction from the whip and debtor days that we acquire to what the performance we get out of them. And that really, I think, proves what I'm talking about, about the uniqueness. You can't achieve that if you're a silo business as a one-team culture across 23, where everyone knows how it works at nights. I think that shows you consistently the results we can get as one business. And that's what we've worked on so hard over the whole period, but we've spent the last sort of years seeing full integration across all 23 offices. We call that as well a cashback guarantee when we do acquisitions. Because on average, we get about £800,000 back out of an acquisition, and there's the evidence there. Looking forward now, we're very clear, and this is well known amongst our executive directors, amongst all the client service directors and business service directors, and a lot of the partners know that we're really focused on doubling the business in the medium term. You'll ask, well, what do I mean by medium term? 
If I'm being super confident, I'll say three years. If I'm being more prudent, I'll say five. So three to five years, we'll double the business. We've more than quadrupled the business in the last six years, and we've been taking it steady in the last two. So we're really confident we can double the business now, obviously top line and bottom line. I'll talk about how we're going to do that organically, and I'll talk briefly about acquisitions. The rough mix, I'd say there's roughly a third organically and two thirds acquisitively is how we'll achieve it. Have we got the runway for this? Absolutely. This can go on for years. There's 200 law firms still to consolidate in the commercial and private wealth space. There's nine and a half thousand law firms, but we're just focused on 200 of them, which do decent quality commercial work in the regions and private wealth work. And that's what we're focused on really is continuing to consolidate so we become the regional dominant provider. I'll talk no more about that. I want to get into the actual organic growth. Now, Kate's touched on these, but I'm just going to sort of go over them again. We've seen this year a 5% price increase. And what we've done now for two years, which I think is really effective, is bring those price increases in on the 1st of November to actually come into effect on 1st May. So we notify everybody, client and colleague, 1st November, six months ahead of 1st May. So the 1st May price increases that we've just seen come through the clients being seen them for six months and our colleagues have, and therefore we get full year effect of them in a very compliant way. We see that carry on. So we don't know next year's price increases yet, but there's a real gap between us and top 50. We're about 40th in the revenue ladder. If you look at the size of law firms, and there's about 20% in price. We're 20% less than the top 50 law firms when you look at the sort of regional commercial work and private wealth work. So there's still a gap between us and our peers. So we still see price increases going forward. Kate's mentioned we've already seen in the first two months of this financially a 30% increase in the value of our residential property business compared to last year. That's really recovered. It recovered in January. We see new client wins. We're just now, we feel, with 150 million, 23 offices, fully integrated business, everybody really settled now, churn's gone down. We're seeing now clients starting to get used to nights and becoming more aware of nights and larger clients because of that national scale. I think we're on the start of building a brand. I've never really believed in brand being that important in the regional law firm space. It's much more about relationships. All of our big clients are with us because of a partner relationship. But I think the scale of this business now and the dominance we have in the regions is starting to begin the journey of a brand, which will make clients more aware of the quality that's on offer on their doorstep. The Land and Expand is all about acquisitions, bringing organic opportunities, and I'm going to focus on one shortly as an example. The partner recruitment, we've seen the numbers up this year, or the year we're reporting, up 48%. We see the partner numbers and senior partner hires going up from here, more sites, more awareness of the business, more awareness of the culture, the legal profession is starting to get used to our presence being a disruption consolidator. And I think that's calmed down to allow us, I think, to recruit more people. And the corporate activity, Kate touched on Convex. This is the joint venture where we've invested to have an interest in this business. They are bulging at the seams now. And I can see, obviously, that's a good sort of signal for what's coming up for the lawyers. But we're also seeing referrals now. We've already had three transactions come out of Convex the significant six-figure fees for our corporate lawyers. So there's a real benefit for our corporate people to then receive work from Convex. And um, we're starting to work much more together where we can introduce the sale mandate only corporate finance business and we can introduce sale opportunities to them and they vice versa, getting used to our corporate team to use our corporate lawyers. So there's a real sort of win-win coming out of that investment. It's going to be a superb investment for us. The recruitment, the recruitment is really important because the fastest route in a relationship model, which the regions definitely is, as I've mentioned, the fastest way to attract quality clients is actually to go and recruit the actual client relationship holders, which is the partners. And the number one reason they look at this more than equity partnership is the no financial risk, the second box down there. With us, they can earn the same or more money without financial risk. And this is attractive to existing equity partners, but it's also incredibly attractive to the next generation coming through because there's many studies over the last 10, 20 years have shown that the next generation coming through don't want to borrow £200,000 to put into a law firm to earn a bit more money. There's interest now on that money. It's a personal liability and they don't like the risk. They're a very risk averse culture lawyers. So there's no financial risk in our business model. It's always been prominent, but I think in an interest environment, 
they feel the risk even more. And that's the number one driver. The second and third drivers, I'd say, are culturally, they see that it's very much a togetherness, low churn, happy place to be. And thirdly, because we now do full service, absolutely everything a corporate client needs, including tax, intellectual property, competition law, you name it, that regional law doesn't do, they can bring their significant client following or their large client safely on board because we do everything to support that client. So there's some real drivers now, and the quotes there from Jeremy and Leon are just typical of what we hear in our business. It's a very happy ship, but the quality is getting higher and the breadth of our services is complete now. I mentioned an acquisition which shows the opportunity to grow organically. Teesside in its second full year to 30 April 24 grew by 29% in revenue. And it did it because it had settled down. It takes a year for an acquisition to fully sort of settle down and start to take on board a modern commercial legal service business rather than the traditional, more sort of old-fashioned partnership model. This group, they're a fantastic group. They've all fully bought into it. I can see them staying for a long time, as I can with all the quality people that we acquire. They approached us three years ago now to sell for two reasons. One, to make a financial return for their own investment in their own small law firm. But secondly, and it was equal first for them, they wanted to take their business to the next level. And what that meant was doing all the work locally for the first freeport status, the airport that's there now that's gone more international, all of the infrastructure investment that's going into Teesside. It's a really sort of thriving area from the point of view, certainly of investment and being attracted to it. And they wanted to be the player that was involved in all of that sort of work and investment and transactions. And that's worked. We now are the go-to for the Regional Development Corporation up there. And it just illustrates the organic opportunities by acquiring in tertiary locations. We're seeing this currently in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, just starting now, where we've been in Newcastle-upon-Tyne for a year. We're seeing it in Bristol. We're seeing it in Carlisle. This is an example which we will be seeing more of particularly in tertiary outside Manchester, Burnham, Leeds. So to sum up, and then we'll take some questions. We're happy with FY24, but I think more importantly, it's the inflection point we're seeing now for the current trading going forward and all the things we've been saying. We're happy with all the integration work we've done, all the cost control work we've done. But I think as importantly, we're seeing a really good start to the year, with, particularly with residential property. And I think m and is soon going to be coming back in September. We've gathered ourselves as well with some dedicated direct resource to how we can talk to large clients and general counsel. And we've had this now for 18 months and we're seeing some results now on the large corporate side. And that will, I think, gain reputation going forward, as I've said. The recruitment I've mentioned, I see recruitment increasing from the 40 that we did last year. I haven't mentioned much about acquisitions because I think organic growth is the priority. It's the priority for us. We won't get our share price re-rated without strong single-digit organic growth being repeated. We know that. So the acquisitions, I think, will only count if we can really achieve that organic growth. And we know that, and that's what we've been working on continue to. But I can say here that the pipeline of acquisitions has never been so full or never been so exciting. So you will be reading about acquisitions going forward because we're ready to do them now. We've got the business in a really solid state to now grow geographically through acquisition. We're confident about the organic growth return we've mentioned, and we wouldn't be saying we're going to double this business in front of you when it's been recorded and in front of all our investors in the next few days without us being pretty confident that that's going to be something we achieve in the medium term. So thank you very much. We'll take some questions. Your increased guidance for CapEx for next year, could you break that down a little bit further than the headline number? Um, the uh, I'll say as you mentioned um, from centralization of some activities uh, and also synergies derived from uh, past acquisitions during FY24. What's the annualized benefit of those next year in FY25? Um, and then for the employee NPS, obviously that's a lagging indicator. Um, so I was just wondering what the main reason for that in terms of why it came down in the year and also confidence about that agreement going forward given the stuff we've done during FY24. Um, so CapEx, we've talked about um, a total of um, 11 million uh, for next year. That will be the, the normal amount, about sort of two, two to three in terms of IT. And then the rest is in terms of property. So it's us finishing off the property um, refurbishments that we, we've been doing. We're doing um, a big refurbishment of our office in Stoke. And then we're moving some of our other offices, for example, Sheffield. When we acquired that, it had a, 
um, an office space much bigger than we needed, not very efficient. So we're moving that this year as it's come out of it to the end of its lease into a new um, facility, but which will be more efficient going forward, but it needs a refurb so that people are coming into the same quality places that everybody else does. So that that's why and we're, the last two years we've seen a bit more CapEx, but that's been us ca catching up really with stuff that we've not spent over the past. Once we do that, effectively, I think the, virtually all of our property portfolio then is at is a, a high grade A space that we'd want it to be. In terms of cost savings, in, in terms of support staff savings, we've saved um, at least over a over million pound there, probably just one and a half million pounds in terms of support staff savings that we've seen going um, there. Through the centralisation of things, through automation of a few different things, we've managed to make some savings there. Um, and then in terms of other operating costs, there's easily over a million pounds there in terms of savings. Now, some of that will, will come through. Some of that we'll be using to invest in, in IT and, and AI going forward. So there's there's three million plus in terms of savings, but that's really good. It's because it gives us that headroom to continue to leverage the cost, but investing in things that we see as important for growth going forward. Employee MPS, I think the... I mean, it's a tough scoring system in playing MPS. As you know, if you if you get seven and eight, gets you no point. Nine and ten gets you a point, and anything six and below gets you a point knocked off. So it's a pretty tough scoring system. I don't worry about plus twenty and plus, going to plus fifteen. But I think to answer your question, we've definitely now got a, a more experienced client service director group who look after the offices, and that's a thousand of twelve hundred and fifty employees. So the fee earning side is more advanced in its management because the client service directors have had more experience and time. I think we've done better in recent, even recent weeks to get around all the partners. We've we've gone around as a management team, the self case and CEO with, with all the 270 partners. We've done that in the last month and met them all um, and been with them a bit, a bit more socially. I think that's been a, a great advance. Um, I think the fact that it's settled and maybe the, we're out of a mini recession and we've had a change of government. All these things impact people's sort of mood, I think. And I think hopefully now as things are more settled, I think that would bring a, a, a bit more positive vibe that we can then hopefully improve therefrom through good management. So I would expect the employee NPS to not go down from plus 15. I'd be dis really disappointed if it did. I, I'd expect to get back in the 20s perhaps. I don't, if you can get it in the 30s and we have, it's, it's it's amazing because it's uh, it's such a tough scoring system. So I think something in the twenties for us is is good, very good mood. I think in the teens it's probably less good mood, but I think there's other factors that are at play there. I think you've seen a, a massive vote against the Tories this time. I think there was a reaction there, wasn't there? To I think you had one of the worst uh, elections for people turning out. I think it was about the second worst. So I think the generally it's been a bit flat in the country over the last year or two with the sort of economic state as well. And we've had a mini recession with interest rates. Returning. So all these things are not necessarily all in our control, but we're certainly working incredibly hard with the partners. I think the partners now in the business have had another you know, two or three years if they were acquired three or four years ago to settle and become local leaders. I think the key, one of the key things we have to work through, and we've gained this through experience of doing so many acquisitions, is that not to not to leave them the feeling that they're not empowered. We need the local partners to feel autonomous and empowered to be captains on the pitch to motivate people around them. And I think that's something we've, we've really put some effort into in the last, in the last year. So uh, you'll, you'll ask me again in six months or 12 months' time, um, I'd hope that would be back in the 20s. But the, the, the mood in the, in, the, in the business doesn't feel that it's declined in that way. Can I ask about yeah. pricing? You've got, you said you're sort of 20% off the top 50. Um, is that a conscious place that you want to remain in order to continue gathering on share, or is that something? It's a little bit. I, I'm, I'm picking that against a DLA, a Pinsons, an Adel Shores, so, you know, that Gowling, Rag & Co business. So it's it's really hard for us to pick a competitor. You know, if, if you pick the competitors in the secondary cities then the top those firms i've just mentioned in the top 30 top 50 are you'd say probably are to a degree but we want to be in the mid market they're trying to do the institutional work so i don't even see competitive competition there once you come out into the 20 tertiary locations it, it's a local independent that we're competing with where we'll be more expensive than them so i'm only really comparing them against the top 50 which isn't isn't 
that helpful in some ways. Now we've got time to talk about it because there's plenty of locations where we don't come across them. So I think it, to answer the bottom line, Sharon, I think, yes, I think something like 10 to 20% difference between us and the top 50 is probably about right. And I think at some point, price increases will slow down. I think, I think we've probably got another year ahead and then we'll see. But I think it's, you know, inflation's come back down. So that, that's a factor where I think pricing will slow off at some stage. But I think we'll have many other drivers to this. And the fact we've lost those couple of headwinds that debt interest brought, or offset, it was net positive for us with all the client interest money. But I think now we're seeing a stabilization on interest and mortgage rates. I think we're going to go into a very busy period of residential property and MA. And we've lost the, you know, the MA 2023 was about one of the worst years for law firms in MA. So, and I've sort of witnessed that for 30 years, and 2023 was definitely bottom core style. So, I think we're, I think all, we should be all back on all cylinders now, uh, certainly when we reach the autumn on MA. With the MA question in mind, your conversations with owners now in a, you know, in a very full pipeline, um, are they feeling better about the world? And is that sort of coming through in, in pricing um, you know, conversations? Or you know, is it still pretty depressed? I'm thinking interest rates coming down, as you say, stable government, are they feeling better about either selling or pushing prices up? And then the second one, you mentioned coming into London for property is that likely to be full office lease or are you thinking going into serviced offices as a, as a cheaper route to that potentially let me just pick the last one up so don't forget this <laughs> the uh, i think we've we've tried service offices already we've, we've had a service office which we stopped six months ago i think now it will be a little it will be a small full service offering um because i think we've got enough people now on real estate and corporate wanting to who've got clients in london and we've got a, a significant premium top end residential property offering that you know is in places like waybridge particularly but also oxford also wilmslow that have london clients so we definitely need to be in london uh, for our people to be able to trade with their clients and i think it will cover corporate real estate um and residential property if we found and we've, we've certainly had conversations with with some a sort of regional style operation that's small, and I'm talking 30 lawyers, 40 lawyers that's in London, we might even acquire something that is then our base. But it would be very much a small um, base for our people to operate from because we get, we've got demand from quite a few lawyers now saying, when, when can we please have somewhere in London to see our clients? On the, our own m and our own acquisition strategy, I don't think anything's going to change with pricing, even though I think there's slightly more fear in the in the in the model, in the profession. I think the the league profession is and the partnership model is getting older. The people in it are getting older. The next generation hasn't been coming through for quite a while now, at least 10 years, probably longer. So you're seeing an aging equity partnership model that I think is concerned about. How they where where do they go to for their succession for their re, for their return of capital and if we come along and pay for goodwill then it, you know it's it really is Christmas come early for them so I think we're very attractive to them there's nobody else doing it we've never met another bidder in the 24 acquisitions we've done the 20 since IPO we've never met another bidder we're not anticipating really seeing any bidders private equity other law firms accountants. Uh, and it's, it's not unlike the account space where it's getting getting pretty busy now. Um, so we've got it to ourselves still. I don't think prices will come down though because we want to buy the good businesses and the top quality law firms have a you know have an expectation of return that I can easily answer it's one times revenue. I think that gives them their return that that justifies them reducing their profit share. I think it generally equates to six or seven years money when you work it all out with profit share and compared to capital and what we pay them because we pay them less than their profit share. It gives us the opportunity to make the synergy cost savings to get the multiple below five times EBITDA. Um, so, uh, but to get to unlock those opportunities ends up being circa one times revenue. Sometimes it's 0.9, sometimes it might be 1.1. But I don't see the price changing. But I do see the mood for equity partners to want to sell increasing. But that won't re- that won't give a reduction in price, Steve, because we're buying the good ones. Just on Colmex, uh, just so I can understand it, are you just making revenue from the referral of legal work, or do you share their fees for advising on M and A? And is that 
but you're trying to move more widely into non-legal services. It's just an opportunistic thing where you knew you had a seller had to sell kind of thing to get money. So, so the last bit again? Oh, yeah, RBG had to get some cash in somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they, well, it's public domain. What they paid for it, isn't it? They paid 20 and the management team bought it back for two. Um, and the management team are, are buzzing. We back, back them to do an MBO effectively. So we have a we have a carry interest that kicks in to pay dividends once our loan's been repaid. So the loan has to be repaid, and I think they will be able to repay that quickly. The way they're trading now, it's incredibly profitable. They're very buoyant. They had a tough 23, but now they're having an incredibly busy 24. Um, so I think our loan will be repaid. Then we have a dividend right that will carry on um, going forward. That doesn't end. That's an, you know, that's a constitutional dividend right. Um, and then we get the certainly the synergy revenue of fees from the. You know, my hope, optimistically, is that we'll, we should be doing 30, 40, 50 percent of their transactions. Ultimately, once we've built the relationship, because they're only going to do it if they're confident in our people. Um, they operate autonomously. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to do just what David says. But I hope that we can win their confidence to do a good chunk of their deals legally, on top of the dividend. But it doesn't represent the movement you do. I've always said that the where appropriate working from the core, Sam, so that gets us in earlier and in the food chain, because the law is at the end. Corporate finance is a great example that we sit there waiting for deals to have to be ready to be done. Wouldn't it be wonderful? And convex is a route to this where we can be in at the beginning. The other opportunity of convex was is private wealth, because everybody should be thinking about their wills and IHT planning and CGT structuring before they've even found a buyer. Uh, when they're looking to convert shares to cash. So that's another, and we're very strong in private wealth now nationally. We've, we've hired some amazing private wealth partners in the last year. And we, we're looking to get those, those people, our very best experts in front of sellers with Convex because that gets the relationship sticky for us. So the, the, if we can find other things that get us in earlier to the, to the professional services cycle, then we definitely are interested. And it gets us sticky. And then we don't have to compete on fees or, tenders or pitches because we've got the relationship so if there's other opportunities like that then yes i see in real estate perhaps project management you know, the old sort of quantity surveying i think we've looked at project management in the past but there's so much you know the map that we've put up today really shows and and our appetite for acquisitions but on the on the top of strong organic growth we do want to concentrate on consolidating this space as we've done so that will occupy most of our time but where we can um, tax would be another great opportunity for us. We're definitely in the mood to acquire a tax business if we can, but there's not many of them. Um, but we want to bolster up our tax offering because, again, you can talk to every, everybody about their tax strategy. You can talk to everybody about their succession and inheritance tax strategy. And I think tax strategies are going to become more and more focused on going forward with the socialist government and just generally the fact the country's got to raise money. So I think... Perhaps this is going to be an important thing for us to concentrate on. We have a question from Tom Callan at Investec. Thanks. Uh, I've got three, actually. That's that's OK. Um, David, you mentioned before about CL Medilaw uh, clearly doing very well at the moment, but you, you sort of alluded to the fact that you, you thought that might slow down a little bit moving forward, just sort of keen to get a bit more, more colour on why you think that that might slow. Um, in terms of the ambitions to double the business in the medium term, Apologies if I missed this, but are we are we talking about EBITDA or, or PBT and and either or is there a sort of an associated margin target with that? Um, sort of um, remembering the fact that I think there was sort of a twenty percent PBT margin target in the market beforehand. So just wanted a bit more detail on that, and then just just in terms of sort of longer term, in terms of um, that high single digit organic growth. Um, Kate, what do you sort of see in terms of um, an optimum split between price and, and volume here? Uh, you know, sort of long, long term, what, what do you think that that will look like? Thanks. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the first part answer the second. Kate can maybe finish it off and then do the third. Um, I think CL Medal, I think, will. They've gone through such a period of growth that I think now it's I think then there's just sort of ready for maybe slowing down. Um, I think also they're so specialist with the cerebral palsy side and the clean neck. They do catastrophic injury too, that, but I think they're reaching maybe a little point of leveling off. I mean, part, part of it is it's, it does so well, but it would be nice to have a, a breather as well from a cash perspective because 
those whip days do take up cash. So I think I think it will slow down, but I, who knows? They're so successful and they're getting so well known that I might be wrong. But it just feels now that they're ready to absorb what they've been doing over the last year or two. Um, on the doubling the business, that's definitely bottom line as it is top line, whether you take EBITDA or PBT. We mix between the two because we know the market sort of looks at PBT, but you know, we, we also like to look at EBITDA from the point of view of the sort of cash generation. Um, it will be it will be definitely doubling the bottom line as well as the top line. I think we should see margin growth and we should see uh, when you're doubling the revenue, if we can leave our over, overheads as we should be, we should see um, better growth on the bottom line, but we'll just say double to be prudent at this stage. And going from the most recent PBT margin, was that 16.9 up to 20? Well, Kate will want to talk that down and I'll probably want to talk it up. So we'll go somewhere in the middle and I'll hand over to Kate at that point. <laughs> Tom, just, just, to, just to clarify and see our medal, although we're saying it might slow down, I don't think we're thinking it will shrink. We just think it no. won't grow quite as fast. Yeah, so just, just to clarify that. Um, yeah, in, ter- in terms of margin, um, yes, as, as ever, I'd like to prudently increase that. We do see there are lots of things now which are showing that that will start to improve um, in, in the in the medium term. But I, I would always say let's take that at gradual steps, as, you know, sort of half a percentage point sort of at each year. So going from 17, 17 and a half, 18, sort of gradually up, up to that. Um, because as we grow, um, you know, it takes time to get all the synergies out as well. So, again, you'd need a year to stop to actually maximise your margin um, and get it to the maximum level there. In terms of organic growth, going forward um, we've given you the building blocks roughly for next year in terms of the medium term and you know we're still looking um to to deliver um you know mid single digit um organic growth split between um price and volume i'd say probably 50 50 um you know pricing as we've just talked about we think we can still continue probably to increase that at five six percent for a couple of years but then that might start to drop off but then i think as our as we start to win bigger clients as um, our volume will start to increase as the MA markets come back to normal and as we recruit as well the, the bigger we are the bigger our our footprint is the more that we can recruit and continue to bolster our organic growth that way so i think i'd hope to look that it splits 50 50 for a couple of years but then we probably move a little bit more towards volume rather than pricing and that's the end of remote questions Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see you in person and thank you very much for attending.